Hello and welcome back to Railway Mania. Today we are talking about early railway pioneers and specifically the role that nonconformist religion played in the early days of the locomotive. Joining me is a very special guest. For some people you might say they wrote the book on a particular topic, but for this guest I think it would be better to say he wrote all the books. Welcome to Railway Mania, Anthony Dawson. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm uh... Very flattered to be here and enjoy your podcast. If you could first tell us a bit about yourself, uh, how did you fall down the railway rabbit hole and how did writing about it become your vocation? I I blame my mum, as Freud would say. My mum was a railway enthusiast and she and my dad either owned or were part of an owning group which had an 8F. And that spent many years in a coal yard in Wakefield with some Mark 1s. I don't know which one it was... Uh, or is, but there's a story goes that when they were looking for the first married home, my father was looking for something with a sufficiently large drive on which to place an 8F. Mum, however, said no. Hence it arriving in the coal yard in Wakefield. It's just, it's just the normal sort of family conversation. Though. Just a normal yeah. family yeah. conversation. And she had an engage layout, which got myself and my brother into railways. But there's also some family history, as one ancestor was a station master at Snaith on the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway. And this is going to sound like a cliche, but another ancestor was, if not murdered, or at least he disappeared on the railway. He, He boarded a train at London on the night ferry. This is in the 1920s. Got to France, got on the, the train bleu for Paris at Calais. And by the time the train had left Calais-Ville and arrived in Paris, he wasn't on it. The suggestion is he was murdered on one of the most famous named trains in Europe. Um, It's all over the newspapers in the 1920s, but we still don't know what actually happened to him. But dear Miss Christie, um, read your story. (laughs) I mean, with that kind of story, it's no wonder you became an author. I thought you were going to say he drove the Flying Scotsman. (laughs) Now, everybody's done that. (laughs) So how did you become interested mainly in early 19th century railways then? Again, I think through my mum, because uh, she trained as a teacher and she did a couple of lessons on early railways and things like that. And we went to see the Iron Duke replica and rockets when it was at the NRM. But for me, I just found it far more interesting. I'm one of those weird people who thinks flying Scotsman and Mallard are a little bit boring. A bit modern. A bit modern, a bit too new. I would prefer something that looks more like a kettle on wheels. And having been a member of staff and a railway volunteer at the Science and Industry Museum in Manchester, and having been the regular fireman and learning to drive on the Planet Replica, it's a case of, yeah, this is far more interesting. This is actually hands-on fun. This is driving a steam engine by the seat of your pants. This is the Wright Brothers level of technology. Uh, And with locomotives like Planet... You can see what everything does. It's it's honest. And there's nothing quite like it running at all. So how did this um, interest in the technology develop into your series of books on the subject? I think a dissatisfaction with what was already in print. Most of it for the Liverpool and Manchester of Stockton and Darlington is over 40 years old now. We've moved on since then. We've moved on especially in how we understand early railways, early locomotives, thanks to the use of replicas. So a lot of the books from the 1980s, when there was a big, the 150th of Liverpool and Manchester, they're talking about Rocket, but from a purely theoretical point of view, they're not talking from the point of view we've actually had this replica of Rocket running and found out what she can and can't do. Same with books talking about Planet. Well, we now know what it can do. But there's also been increased interest in early railways, especially thanks to the Newcomen Society, the Railway Canal Historical Society, and Beamish, of course, with the early railways groups, study groups, and the series of early railways conferences. They are fantastic, but the problem is, and this is something I'm really enthusiastic about and something I picked up on at university, is the difference between town and gown. Academics like to write for other academics and talk to other academics, and then there's those outside academia, and then near the twain shall meet. So it's like trying to bridge that gap, trying to make... I think early railways are amazing, they are fun, they're exciting, they're a crucial period to talk about, but I think they're seen as being academic. They're not for the average enthusiast. 
So what, what I've been trying to do is make them accessible, make them fun, put my love and passion of trundling up and down with Planet into print on YouTube or wherever and say, look, this is amazingly good fun. You should be interested in this. And hope my passion for the subject and my nine and a half ton baby <laughs> comes across and gets other people interested and explains it in a way that's understandable, which isn't all highfalutin academia stuff, but actually is understandable and gets other people interested. Yes. Planet is smaller, but maybe more of a handful than an 8F. So, um, you know... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've definitely got room for her on my drive. <laughs> Excellent. Our subject matter for this episode is nonconformist religion, but I think it's worthwhile that we set up what we mean by that phrase. I think from stuff I've read from you, this means going way back to the 1660s. The Church of England is the established religion of the country. The church and state are extremely close and push through something called the Clarendon Code. Can you tell us what that is? We might have to go back a bit further. Um, during the Civil War, Britain had no established religion. You could be whatever religion you want. A lot of people think Cromwell was a religious bigot, and he was. He was deeply anti-Catholic. But at the same time, he also welcomed back the Jewish people into England for the first time since they were expelled in the Middle Ages and granted them freedom of worship. So it's a bit of a mixed bag, you might say. So before 1662, there was freedom of worship for you could be anything you wanted or nothing. In 1660, there was a restoration of the monarchy and the king said to these diverse religious groups, uh, I won't reinstate a national church. I won't reinstate a single form of the Bible or prayer book. And that got them all on side to support the restoration of the monarchy. Two years later, there was an act of parliament called the Act of Uniformity. And that imposed on the church in England a single form of the Bible, a single prayer book, the Book of Common Prayer, a document known as the 39 Articles, which established the Church of England. And as a result of that, over 2,000 members of the clergy were kicked out and an unknown number of lay people. The clergy had their right to preach or officiate to be revoked. And then the Clarendon Code came in, which effectively said that unless you are a member of the Church of England, you have effectively no civil rights. So ejected clergy couldn't live within five miles of an incorporated town. You couldn't meet for worship. You couldn't have more than 12 people gathered together obviously pre-Covid. Quite a lot pre-Covid. Quite, yeah. To gather for worship or prayer, things like that. And there was another piece of legislation called the Test and Corporation Act, which stated that unless you were a member of the Church of England who took communion, you couldn't hold public office, you couldn't enter certain professions, you couldn't be a lawyer, you couldn't be in the armed forces, uh, you couldn't be a teacher. You were denied an education in a parish school, and all schools were administered by the parish, which were part of the Church of England. And it also meant you didn't have a right to study at the universities in England. And one of the scary things is, you couldn't study for a PhD at Oxford or Cambridge as a nonconformist until the 20th century. Wow. So when we talk about these groups of people who are excluded, who are we talking about? We're talking about, in the, in the 17th century, we're talking about the Quakers, the, the Religious Society of Friends, a movement started by George Fox in the 1650s, talking about the Baptists. Again, th these are all called old descent, and Baptists believed in adult baptism rather than infant baptism, which split them off from the Church of England, which believes in infant baptism. The Presbyterians, they have a different mode of governance. They don't believe in having bishops and whatnot, uh, and each, that each congregation should rule itself effectively and appoint its own minister. Uh, and then there was the Unitarians, and they're different again, because they don't have any set creed or statement of belief, but they do reject the idea of the Holy Trinity, of God is one in three and three are one, the bumper value bargain pack of God, uh, and reject the idea that Jesus was anything but a human being. So is that where the name Unitarian comes from? Because they believe that God is one rather than three. God is one, yeah. Okay. And Unitarian belief was actually legal in Britain until 1813. Oh, wow. 
One of the last executions was for a Unitarian in Scotland in the 1780s. And as a Unitarian, you, not only was your religious belief illegal, but you weren't even allowed a trial by jury. You could be put in prison without any sort of hope of being able to defend yourself. Yeah. Not a great look. How did that unfold over the next 200 or so years, bringing us towards where we get to the starting point of railways? What you get in the middle of the 18th century is something called partial toleration. Uh, at the end of the 17th century, there was an act of toleration which allowed uh, Quakers, Unitarians, Baptists, Presbyterians to have their own places of worship so long as they were licensed by an Anglican bishop. That was in 1688. That allowed these groups to worship. Then it's something called partial toleration, which said, OK, right, fine. We accept that people who aren't Anglicans exist. And we're going to change the law a little bit to make things a little bit easier. You can hold public office. You can train to be a lawyer. You can be an army officer. So long as you take Holy Communion in your Anglican church once a year, but you have a certificate signed by your bishop to say you have, and you've paid an exorbitant amount of money to do so. So like a doctor's note for missing PE. Yeah, to do it every year, saying this person has taken communion, mm. he has paid £100 for it, he's good to go for 12 months. And that meant that a lot of nonconformists were branded as hypocrites mm. because they stuck to their own religious belief, but in order to get on in society, you had to be a member of the Church of England. So that, yeah, OK, we will pay £100 or whatever it was, we will take communion once a year. So it's always putting people in an impossible situation. It's an impossible position, yeah. So 1813, you have the partial toleration of Unitarian worship, um, which says it's no longer illegal to say that Jesus isn't God. And what was the driving force behind that? Was it just social pressure? Or was it changing attitudes in the clergy? Changing attitudes and directly petitioning Parliament by, in particular, Unitarians. A chap called William Smith who was an MP in London, and he was the grandfather of Florence Nightingale. And he put together his big petition to get the law changed. The problem was there had been a movement to in the 1780s to not just tolerate Unitarian worship, but also Roman Catholic worship. But suddenly you had the French Revolution in 1789, where they abolished their state religion, said freedom of worship for everybody, it's okay to be an atheist. The government in Britain panicked and went, we can't be having any of this. We need to unite our citizens behind the country to support our war effort. We don't like this idea of republicanism. We don't like the idea of liberty, equality and fraternity. And any movement for religious reform, for toleration for Roman Catholics or Unitarians was effectively squashed for the next 20 odd years. So that brings us into the early 19th century then. Yeah. And particularly Unitarians and Quakers, they fiercely believe in equality, that everyone is born equal, that everyone has the same worth, should be shown the same dignity and respect. And for Quakers, that meant not using titles. So as no lord, sir, everyone is a friend or a brother and a sister. Well, you can see how that would have gotten on uh, the establishment's nerves at the time. Uh, and... It, you had to show deference to your social superior, either tugging the forelock or taking your hat off. And Quakers famously don't take the hats off for anybody, and that put them in prison. Mm. And for communities like the Quakers and the Unitarians, which believe in equality, suddenly in the 1790s, everything is going wrong. The Unitarians in particular had supported the French Revolution, because the French Revolution originally started out with abolition of uh, absolute monarchy for a constitutional monarchy. It wasn't the bloody mess that we remember from the terror, from Robes of Pierre. And the French Revolution was supported in Britain by liberals, by the intelligentsia, by the radicals, because they thought France was coming in, finally coming into the 18th century, throwing off medieval custom. And it was seen as a great beacon of hope, movement for change across Europe of liberation and equality. And Unitarians were chomping at the bit saying, this is brilliant. We believe in equality, we believe in liberty, liberty of conscience, liberty of expression, uh, liberty of religion. But this all massively backfired when war finally came in 1792, because the Unitarians in particular were seen as almost like a fifth column. Mm. Because they said, yes, equality is a good thing. And you've got William Pitt, the prime minister, saying equality is not a good thing. Democracy isn't a good thing. We're going to fight this. And in cities like Leeds, Nottingham, 
and famously Manchester and Birmingham, there were anti-Unitarian riots. And in Birmingham, the Unitarian chapel was destroyed and burned down and the minister, uh, Joseph Priestley, was nearly murdered. The same happened in Manchester. And so it became not quite the troubles of Northern Ireland of sectarian violence. But in the 1790s, there was very real sectarian violence against Unitarians, not just because of their belief, which was considered to be heretical and blasphemous, but because their religious belief in equality and liberty was also seen to be seditious. So they were very much seen as the enemy. They were, they were dangerous. It's shades of what you see later on in um, like the minor strikes and things like that and, and the British government's view of Bolshevik revolution in Russia and, and seeing that as a real threat. Yeah, they were, they were an absolute threat. Because they don't want that to happen to them. Yeah. We get to 1813. Unitarianism becomes not illegal. Have, have the laws of the Clarendon Code been abolished by then? Mostly during uh, 1812. And what about the Test and Corporations Act? That was partially repealed in 1828. Oh, so quite a lot later then. Quite a lot later. So this brings us really to the beginnings of our story. So people who are nonconformist at that time, they can't get a conventional education. Yeah. They can't study at a university. Yeah. But at that time coincides with the emerging technologies of iron, steam, coal. And this isn't really taught in universities at the time. No. What these groups did was they started their own schools, started their own schools, started their own colleges. Uh, and it was also the period where you started to get the early mechanics institutes, which taught working men how to read and write, but also taught technical subjects. Mm-hmm. It's also we get organisations like the literary and philosophical societies. Again, these are largely middle class, largely nonconformist organisations for the furtherment of knowledge. They're quite technical institutions which attract the best minds in a particular area. So you start to get the spread of ideas that way, which means you get this growth of network because groups like Unitarians and Quakers were so discriminated against under law and in society. They were literally beyond the pale. No one respectable would marry a Quaker. No one respectable would marry a Unitarian. You wouldn't apprentice your son to one you wouldn't do business with one which is why you start to get a flowering of quaker businesses run by quakers using quaker methods for other quakers um particularly in in banking like barclays bank originally a quaker and lloyd's as well i think and lloyd's uh, or chocolate yes when i was reading for this episode it's cadbury's fries and round trees were all started by quakers oh yeah it's amazing obviously a big fries influence in my area, Bristol, because yeah. there was the factory right in the centre. But it, so in this respect, they almost make me think of Republican Rome's equestrian class. Yes, pretty much. Who didn't have any voting power at all, yeah. but were great at business and had amassed vast fortunes, but oh, yeah. couldn't do anything with it. Yeah. And no no representation in government, because yeah. it was shut out. You did reference setting up colleges. Is this like University College London? University College London, uh, Owens College in Manchester. Okay. Um, but the situation was different in Scotland, of course where there was no uh, religious test for admission to university. So the usual route for English nonconformists was to nip over the border to Edinburgh or Glasgow. And do we see that in groups of Quakers? Do they get university educations or do they steer away from that? Not so much the Quakers, but the Unitarians, definitely. OK, OK. Well, we'll come on to the Unitarians in a moment, because I think this is a good place to introduce railways into the yeah. mix, being the subject of the podcast. Obviously. I think it brings us on quite nicely to the Pease family in the northeast of England. So Joseph Pease, who I mentioned in Railway Mania episode one, and I remember getting quite confused because they really like the first name Joseph. So sometimes he's referred to as Joseph Pease the third, not directly the third, but he was the third one in the dynasty of Pease family called Joseph. Yeah. So he was the first Quaker to permitted to take a seat in Parliament in 1832. They'd been a Yorkshire family. Um, what kind of businesses were they working? Because men- you know you've mentioned chocolate, you know you've mentioned banking. They were mill owners. Right. Well, Yorkshire makes sense. Yorkshire makes sense. Again, part of the North Riding makes sense. They were uh, textile manufacturers. So that's where... Uh, There's also an emerging technology with the invention of you know looms and yeah. proper mills and power yeah. uh, rather than hand wheels for everything. Yeah. And they also got into uh, coal mining as well. And does that bring with it the move to the Tees area? Huge coal and iron district. Yeah. Quaker families are big 
and intermarried because they would only marry within the community. In fact, for Quakers, if you married out of the faith, you could be ejected. So it works both ways. So looking at Quaker family trees is like looking at a bramble patch. Mm -hmm. Everybody's married to everybody else. Everybody's related to everybody else. It's, It's referred to as the Quaker Mafia jokingly, but they are effectively one huge family. Or they were then, because they were very insular, looked within the community. So the Pisas were very much self-reliant, relied on other Quakers to help fund their business. And I guess it would be natural for the son to follow the father's business, take up the mantle. uh, Absolutely. Joseph was Edward's son, and Edward bought out a lot of collieries, as did Joseph in the Tees area. Yeah. And became a huge coal producer. So were they able to do that by getting money from other Quakers through yes. this new banking? Yeah. And what what differentiated that, do you know? Um, what was different about a Quaker banking system to, say, a conventional one at the time? They were considered to be more ethical. Okay. <laughs> yep. Because Quakers are forbidden from lying, forbidden, uh, and, in, and in Quaker society, forbidden from doing bad deals, ripping anybody off. They are very, very honest and believe in many Quaker... There's Quaker testimonies, and it's about treating people with due respect, with equality, and not making, not exploiting people and not making money from uh, war. Yes, well, famous pacifists. Famously pacifists. So Quaker banks were held up as a high ideal of being incredibly ethical, incredibly honest. They weren't going to rip you off. Does this idea of equality and friends and brothers also tie into the slave trade, which was still doing big business at the time? It does, yes. Quakers were forbidden from the 1760s to be slave owners. Okay. Actually, part of their faith, you will not own another human being. And and at the time, were there quite a lot of people in the UK who were slave owners or slave traders? The British economy was almost entirely geared around slavery, or the... I, I don't mean the trade in human lives, but in the triangular trade, especially with America, the goods produced by slaves, but also the goods produced in Britain, the luxury goods, which were demanded by an ever more affluent United States and a growing middle class in the United States. So we were able to produce high quality textiles, furnishings, iron work, machinery, all that stuff, which made people incredibly rich from selling it to America. Mm-hmm. In return, we got coffee, tobacco, sugar, and in the late 1790s, uh, cotton. Okay, so especially places like, say, Liverpool, Manchester, ports and manufacturing towns would have benefited greatly from that trade. Incredibly, yeah. Okay, so there was a lot of business going around like that. I think we'll come on to that when we talk about Liverpool, Manchester later on. At the moment, we're stuck in the northeast. Yeah. So Joseph and Edward, and other people too, helped set up the Stockton and Darlington Railways. Yeah. So I think it's dangerous to say that anything is the first, but when I was reading about railways to begin with, it the Stockton and Darlington was touted as being the first... A railway that had a steam-powered passenger train, but what was it really? What, what formed the Stockton and Darlington? It was a convergence of existing ideas and technology. The idea of a public railway wasn't new, as the earliest, perhaps the first, public railway, where you have a railway open to all users and owned by a publicly owned company, formed expressly to work a railway, uh, was the Lake Lock Railway in Wakefield, where I am from, uh, which opened in 1798. The idea of a passenger railway working to a timetable wasn't new, as the Swansea Mumbles, at least the Oystermouth Railway, which opened in 1807, although it had horse-drawn passenger carriages, was the first passenger-carrying railway with a timetable, and also had what the first passenger station and the first commercial use of steam had been made in 1812 in Leeds in the Middleton Railway with the Blankensop and Murray rack locomotives. So they, these were previous ideas which all came together for the Stockton and Darlington. But it has to be said that the Stockton and Darlington until 1833 worked its passenger service by horses. Mm. So the, 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 that first passenger train for the opening day was a, a one-off, as it were. And if you want to count a one-off event, then perhaps the Penudaran locomotive of 1803, where you had workmen clinging onto the wagons, or even the Blankensop locomotive of 1812, where the colliery workers had a ride in the train, would also count as an early passenger service. So rather than being the first in all of these areas, it's really the first time that we see them actually being stuck together. 
in a way that works. Exactly. It is a functioning railway. It's funded a lot by Quaker businesses. And there is the famous engineer, George Stevenson. George Stevenson had been the engineer. He built it, engineered it, laid it out. George Stevenson has been a locomotive advocate by that point for a decade or more. So it's really slow going because did he have a formal education or was he completely self-taught? He was largely self-taught. Yes, okay, so he's learning things the hard way and by trying to persuade people to give him money and resources to build these experiments, which yeah. might not work. But he, but he also had a team around him. We often get the idea, thanks to the biography by Samuel Smiles, of George working on his own. Mm -hmm. But George wasn't working on his own at Killingworth Colliery. He had a team of people around him, a team of bright young things. And within a couple of hours' walk of Killingworth Colliery, between, 18, say, 1814 and 1815, he could have gone to at least three other railways where there were locomotives at work. Yes, and I'm guessing they all knew each other. They all knew each other. They all knew what they were doing. Mm. And, I, and I think when you think back, it's kind of preposterous that someone would be able to construct something like that on their own. Yeah. I mean, the, the idea for George building a locomotive was giving him to him, and we're probably going to talk about him later, chap called the Reverend William Turner Jr. He was a Unitarian minister at Hanover Square Chapel in Newcastle. And in 1812, he'd been to Leeds to see the Middleton locomotives in operation. So these are the geared... Rack the, the rack and pinion engines. engines. Yes. He went back to Newcastle, gave a talk to the Literary and Philosophical Society, which was published in the newspapers, about these locomotives. And he supposedly said to George, why don't you have a go at it? And if you look at Stevenson's first locomotive, the Blucher, however you pronounce it, it's, it's open to debate. It's basically a copy of... The Middleton Railway locomotive but without the gear wheel. Yeah, this is this is this is in eighteen fourteen. That's amazing, isn't it? Because the short histories will say, uh, you know, Trevithick, Stevenson, and father and son, and then the rest is history. Yeah, but there's actually quite a lot of development going on by multiple people at the time. Quite a lot, yeah, and quite a few dead ends. So the Stockton Darlington gets built. It, the locomotives are built by Robert Stevenson yeah. and company, um, and that's set up in eighteen twenty three using Quaker money. Yeah, they get on reasonably well it'd be fair to say they had was well, the stevensons were unitarians and not quakers yeah that's important to establish yeah. robert stevenson company gets going quite well they weren't established as a locomotive builders per se they were a general engineers who happened to build locomotive um half of their uh, order first set of orders was actually for stationary engines which by then i guess was becoming an established technology yeah so there were steam engine manufacturers, but they were also doing everything else. They were cast, doing general castings, general forgings for, every, for other colleagues. They were making railway wheels, etc. Well, this is something that it, it makes so much sense because I often wondered when reading about, oh, they made a locomotive this year and then they made a locomotive the year after. It's like, well, what did they do for money in the meantime? Were they just sat around? Was it? Did it take all that time just to sell those ideas in? But there must have been this general machining work that actually was their bread and butter. Yeah. And, it, and, and that changed during the 19th century as locomotives came to more prominence. But the firm still made station engines, the firm still made marine engines. So they had a very diverse portfolio, as it were, which meant the firm was better able to weather later 19th century recessions, and in particular the rise of railway companies building their own locomotives, and into the 20th century, imports from America and Germany. What's the relationship like between the Pease family and the Stevenson family? It seems to have been very cordial. Pease Senior certainly took George under his wing. Pease was a very, very good publicist, if that makes sense. He had two products. He had George Stevenson, the man, the engineer. He also had the railway and its locomotives. And he wanted to promote both of them. So do you think that our view of Stevenson now as having single-handedly done all these things is mainly down to P Senior's PR tactics? Yes. Right. Because it's easier to promote a single person rather than a body of people. Yeah. Uh, and P said to Stevenson, he must always be gentlemanlike in his manner. He must always wear a clean shirt every day. He must also always be smartly dressed every day. So he's an engineering celebrity? Yeah. They are manipulating his image in the 18, early 1820s, around the Stockton and Darlington, they're manipulating the image of George Stevenson. If you look at press reports, they're always very careful to mention, not Mr. Stevenson, but George Stevenson, okay. connected with the railway and with his locomotives. It's a very concerted effort to publicise the man and the machine. And then a chap comes along called Nicholas Woods, who writes a very famous treatise on the history of railways, 
and then that is edited to put George in the best possible light. Oh, wow. Okay, so so it's been spin doctored. That's really interesting. So you have the man and then you have the machine, the product that they're promoting, which is they're not claiming sole ownership of it. They're claiming that they're the best in the field at it. Oh, yeah, certainly. And and that takes the form of the Stockton and Darlington? Yes. So the setup of this company, we've touched on this a bit in previous episodes, and it does come up a little bit, is that it's an open access operator. So it's, made, it's operated like a turnpike. So you pay a fee, you can run a train on it. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, you can kind of see the problems emerging. So cornfield meets, head-on collisions could be more than possible. Having to back up to let another train pass stories of fights between engine drivers because it was a single track line <laughs> i mean that you i just don't know how they must be feeling their way around how to make this work yeah uh, it was worked bi-directionally with a single track but what they had were sidings but these were only single ended they weren't full passing loops <laughs> but what they had there was a very very complicated series of bylaws and fines saying who should give way to whom if you were a locomotive or a horse, if you got a full load or an empty load, if you're going uphill or downhill. And coming up where the t- set of points for the siding was, with a set of marker posts. And whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it's a lovely story. This is where the origin of first past the post comes from. <laughs> so the train, whichever train passed the marker post first, could continue on its way. The one which wasn't had to go into the siding to let it pass. So if, you're, if you see a, another train approaching in a distance... Rather than call the common sense option, which is slow down, you might actually speed up, speed up to try and get to the post faster, and then they might do the same in turn. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Also, what you're saying about this being an open access policy, it kind of makes me think of the Nurburgring in Germany. Yes, where you know it's a racetrack, anybody can go on it, but if you overstep the mark and if you mess up, you will pay for it. Yeah, so, so- like and the, the fines are enormous so, so what you have are heavy coal trains worked by locomotives but the stockton and darlington didn't work the coal trains itself they supplied the locomotive and the engine driver and the coal company provided the wagons and then paid the company for the engine power to move the coal train yes okay you then had collieries that used their own horses to move coal trains so they said we're not going to pay those fees yeah we'll we have we'll use horses wagons. we'll pay the access fee yeah. but we don't want to use the locomotives and then there was a passenger service, which was horse-powered using stagecoaches and railway wheels, operated by local stagecoach proprietors, which somehow had also to fit into that mix. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing, really, that, um, you know, it, it wasn't just written off at the time. It, there's the potential for disasters. But it worked, though, that's the thing. It, that Yeah, but th- I guess they, they never had anything else. Yeah. So the, it, when they were learning it, it, it must have made so much sense at the time. But what I wanted to ask was, was this approach to traffic on the Stockton and Darlington, was that just because this idea had never been tried before, or was the open access operator principle in line with the Quakers' view on monopolies? It was in line with Quakers' views on monopolies. So they don't like any one company having control of something? Yeah. They they want to encourage competition. It's very capitalist in that sense. Yes, it is. Okay, and, and that so that was a direct influence of how the Stockton and Darlington... Because when we move over, so we're going over to the West, George Stevenson works on... The locomotives on the Stockton in Darlington, and then he goes to be the engineer on the Liverpool and Manchester. Yeah. Which is a clean slate. They're going to learn from the lessons that have been done in the collieries. They're going to make a, a passenger and goods railway double tracked, fully engineered to be locomotive hauled. What, what what are the key differences? What other key differences are there between the setup of the Liverpool and Manchester and the Stockton in Darlington? It's not a Quaker run enterprise, is it? No. This is so there's three main factions of the Liverpool and Manchester board set up. Yeah. You have the Kingpin, Henry Booth. Yep. Related to Beatrix Potter, which I found amazing. Yeah. A Unitarian. He's yes. famous opponent of the Corn Laws a protester in his youth, maybe? Oh, he was very political in his youth. So how much of the Liverpool and Manchester was reflected in the personality of Henry Booth? How much of it was due to him? All of it. <laughs> yeah. He he was... I mean, the company had been established by John Kennedy and Joseph Sanders, again, both Unitarians, but they had no experience of railways, but they were experienced in running big businesses. Sanders was a corn merchant, and Kennedy, together with James McConnell, had the biggest cotton-spinning mill in Manchester and the world, McConnell and Kennedy. Uh, same McConnells, by the way, who opened the Tallinn Railway in 1863. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's just everybody's related. Everybody's it? related. Everybody's related. It's like this bri- briar patch of marriages. But Booth was the kingpin for it. 
He was the real drive behind it. He had the real vision for building this railway. Um, He was the secretary of the company. And despite the enabling act of saying that the secretary and treasurer could not be the same person, he was also the treasurer. So he just ignored that one. He ignored just, that one. It's just, well, it's too important. It's I too important. To I have to be in charge. So does he have a cabal in this faction of uh, Unitarians around him? He does. Okay. And then you have the two other factions, which are the Quakers, yep. so people like James Cropper, yep. and the Anglicans like Charles Lawrence, who uh, we were talking about slave owning earlier. He was a slave owner. Yeah, he was. Which I guess is not surprising in the Liverpool area. No. I mean, how did these different factions work together? Because they have, well, for some of them, quite conflicting viewpoints. I'm not entirely sure they did. Mm. Never talk about politics or religion, and the board meetings must have been hilarious in that regard. (laughs) The Unitarian faction led by Booth were all pro-Stevenson, pro-locomotive. Well, yes, because you mentioned in your book how James Cropper leads this charge of people to oust Stevenson. Yeah, because he's 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 very anti locomotives because of this Quaker philosophy on monopolies. He didn't want Stevenson and his friends to have the monopoly on locomotive building because they were seen to be the best people for it. Yeah, so he said, no, 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 no. we don't we don't want locos. And it, was it down to this push that the Rainhill trials came about? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, the, James Cropper took a personal dislike to George Stevenson. Oh wow, the makings of a drama now. Yeah, but George Stevenson. He's a great man, but I, I am not entirely sure if he was a nice man. Mm. He was very good at using other people's ideas. Mm. And then we come back to that idea of Stevenson, the PR man. Yeah, the, 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 there's the myth of him, which was created in his own lifetime mm. as the great George Stevenson. But yet he had his enemies, he had his detractors and those who felt really hard done by, like William James, who was the original surveyor and projected the Liverpool and Manchester Railway but was completely ignored by Stevenson. And really, the involvement of James has been ignored by historians until the last 20 or so years. Mm. Uh, when Miles McNair wrote a biography of William James, which actually put him back in the picture, and it actually makes you question a lot of the perceived or received wisdom about what George Stevenson did. So we start to see that perhaps James Cropper was not uh, unfounded in his belief that yeah. Stevenson would have the monopoly on steam locomotive building, because they almost did Yeah, when it went ahead with locomotive foliage. Yeah. I mean, the Rainhill trials were not just a forum for the locomotive, but I think more importantly, they were a forum for the Stevenson locomotive. Mm. Because it would have been very easy for them to say, right, our engineer wants locomotives. Robert Stevenson builds them. There we go. Mm-hmm. Thanks to people like Cropper and his allies, we end up with the Rainhill trials saying, hang on a minute, we don't want a monopoly. There are other people building these locomotives. Let's open it to everybody and let's see not only is the locomotive better than the stationary engine, but is the Stevenson product as good as he says it is? We know Rocket won at Rainhill, but even after Rocket won, the board meeting minutes where Rocket's sisters were ordered, there is a very heated discussion led by Cropper and his allies saying, hang on a minute, let's not award this contract just yet. There are other people building locomotives and he suggests they get a locomotive from, surprise, surprise, a Quaker, <laughs> Goldsworthy Gurney, who'd built building very successful road coaches and had applied his road coach technology to the railways. So before they actually decided to buy Rocket Sisters, there was this big debate of should we actually buy another Stevenson locomotive? I always found it interesting that the legend of Rainhill is that, you know, Rocket decimates everything. But then you know, Hackworth doesn't go away afterwards. No. He was the locomotive uh, and station engine superintendent at the Stockton and Darlington Railway until 1840. He had his own engineering business, but he wasn't a terribly good businessman. Mm. Uh, And it kind of went downhill in the late 1840s. It was called Soho Works, and it was even he was subcontracting and building locomotives for things like the Jenny Lind locomotives, things like that. So he was building modern locomotives. But the suggestion is, from looking at the inventory of the works when it was sold, that he hadn't modernised production techniques. Mm. So he's still very much a blacksmith, everything done by hand type of production, very slow, very expensive, mm. as opposed to using machine tools. But he's, his locomotives were very successful in their own evolutionary niche, doing what they did, moving very heavy coal trains over a very steeply graded line day in, day out. 
I suppose in that sense, what we're seeing the difference between the Hackworth and Stevenson ones is just the the basic difference between, say, Mallard being an express passenger loco, very flash, and something like I don't know, an 8F, um, this very workaday workhorse kind of thing. Very good at its job, but not so glamorous. Yeah, not as glamorous, but the Hackworth locomotive had evolved in a particular niche to suit the northeast. Whereas the Stevenson locomotive was a general product. So anybody could use it? Any, any of the new railways that we... Anybody use, could use it, yeah. it. I mean, it's far more marketable. Yeah. Where do... In the locomotive debate, where do the Anglican faction come down on it? Do they stay out of it completely? They stayed out of the debate completely. They were more concerned about making money out of it. Very much in it as a business opportunity. Yeah, very much so. Well, I suppose they all are, yeah. in a way. But they were very useful because they were part of the establishment or the establishment doors opened to them. Yeah. So they could be like a face. They were the face. They, they were the respectable face of the company to sell this radical new product. Mm. And it's a hard sell by the sounds of it. Oh, absolutely. After this initial period, were there any more conflicts between Cropper's group of Quakers and the Stevensons? That would be an understatement. Um, in 1833, the Reverend Dionysius Larner, um, who Tom Rolt described as an egregious twit, published in the Edinburgh Review a damning editorial saying that the Liverpool and Manchester board of directors were in the thrall of George Stevenson. And the croppers got wind of this, along with their faction and the LNM board. And they could out an investigation with all sorts of uh, resignations on the Liverpool and Manchester. And those resignations included George Stevenson, the team of men who had built the Liverpool and Manchester. Uh, the croppers accused Stevenson of malpractice of showing favouritism. Was there any truth in that? Yeah, as I show in my new book, uh, I think there was, as the then locomotive superintendent, a chap called Anthony Harding, was dismissed for gross misconduct. He'd known George Stevenson since boyhood and had worked with him before. He was dismissed for preferential treatment in offering contracts to his two brothers, and in drawing more wages than he actually had employees. But yet, despite being sacked on the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, George Stevenson would continue to employ him on all his later projects, like the Leicester and Swannington, North Midland Railway, Manchester Leeds Railway, all involved the Hardings. Talking about the Leicester and Swannington, George Stevenson and Robert Stevenson were both involved there. Again in 1833, the Croppers, who were also shareholders of the Leicester and Swannington Railway, said, no, nope, we're not having another monopoly on this railway by the Stevensons, thank you very much. And this group of Quaker Liverpool uh, shareholders said to the Leicester and Swannington board, stop buying your locomotives from Robert Stevenson, and if you must buy new locomotives, please buy them from Lancashire. And this all came to a head in 1834 on the London and Birmingham Railway, where, to quote Robert Stevenson, the Quakers got their revenge. Again, we've got James Cropper as a major shareholder, and again, he is opposed to monopolies. So, again, in London and Birmingham, you've got Robert Stevenson as your chief engineer, and he's supplying the locomotives. Cropper says to the board, we can't have this as a monopoly. This group of Quakers then say to Robert Stevenson, either you sell all your shares in your own company, Robert Stevenson and company, or you no longer work for us as a chief engineer. So they were demanding he sell all of his shares? Demanding all of his shares, divesting himself completely of his own company so he could continue as their chief engineer. Oof. So he wouldn't have that monopoly on supplying locomotives. And the croppers and their allies effectively banned Robert Stevenson locomotives from the London and Birmingham. And this is where it gets really confusing because they're so opposed to monopolies. They then invite Edward Berry in as both locomotive superintendent in charge of all the rolling stock and the engines as the motive power contractor, and remember he's also a locomotive manufacturer in his own right. Do you think that this was mainly down to a personal grudge? I think it must be. They're saying we don't want Stevenson having a monopoly, but then they give a monopoly to Edward Berry. Mm. And I think it must all go back to to James Cropper, having a personal dislike to both Stevensons. And where did Berry come in all this? Did he have a relationship with any of the, the factions that we see earlier on? I don't believe so, but he and both Stevensons had clashed on the Liverpool and Manchester, and they'd clashed over safety. 
because Edward Bury had used wheels up to six feet in diameter, which Joe Stevens thought was dangerous. And his locomotives like copper knob, you know, with a big cylindrical firebox with a big copper dome on top of it. Still with us today. Still with us today. The inner firebox didn't have any stays, which George Stevenson and Robert Stevenson thought was incredibly dangerous. And they said, no, we're not running these locomotives in the Liverpool and Manchester. They're dangerous. Edward Bury said, no, these are perfectly safe. But there's a very public feud between the Stevensons and with Bury that lasted until after the death of both Stevensons and Edward Bury. Wow. I take it to mean that Cropper continued investing in railways after Liverpool and Manchester. He did, yes. Uh, Cropper, together with other Quakers and other Liverpool businessmen, formed what was called the Liverpool Party. And they were major shareholders in most of the railway companies in Britain and in France. After the railway opening, there was a ban of sales of alcohol on railway property. Is that a purely safety reason, or did it have its roots in teetotalism, which are Quakers teetotal? Then they were. Does that have any link to it? Not sure. There's a ban on drinking and a ban on smoking tobacco. Uh, Smoking tobacco in the 1830s socially was akin to smoking a joint in public today. Mm. It wasn't the done thing. It was very much pr- frowned on. So was public drinking of alcohol. It still is, really. Is that because they come out of like the gin craze and, and things like that? Yeah. So binge drinking comes up in the news quite a lot now. But sometimes it's interesting to look back and see just how bad the alcohol intake was, the average alcohol intake was during certain periods. And you think, well, if they've come through that, no wonder they were anti-drinking uh, or anti-smoking in public and debauchery and things like that oh yeah it's 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 not just moralizing it's i suppose it's an attempt at life saving as well Mm. um saving life saving souls very paternalistic so it could be part of the larger sort of discussion about the problems of alcohol abuse in those times yeah certainly it's it's not just like killjoys or you know just people just saying well i don't drink so you shouldn't either it's not just that there's more going on than that so that ties into Something that in the podcast episode on excursion trains, we referenced Susan Major's work where she mentions that there was a lot of pushback from the church on excursions running on Sundays on the Sabbath. But how did the Unitarians and the Quakers feel about the railway business being conducted on Sundays? You mentioned that the Liverpool and Manchester's neighbour, the Grand Junction Railway, felt differently about running on Sundays. But the L&M was really limited? It was, yeah. Largely because Liverpool and Manchester was first. So did the church's attitude to railways change in the meantime when they found out that a lot of people went to church on the train? No. <laughs> okay. In fact, Sabbatarianism only grew, if that makes sense. Um, so the Liverpool and Manchester only ran four trains on a Sunday between the church interval, as it was called, so out of the hours of divine worship. And that was part of its bylaws and its act of parliament, so that was actually a legal thing they had to comply with. The Grand Junction, however, that set of bylaws were completely different. And that's where the clash came. When one company, which was perfectly happy running Sunday trains, came up with another company which had more legal restrictions on running Sunday trains. And do you think that the the restrictions were an outside influence or was it from one of these factions within the company that were pushing for this? It was a bit of both. And how did the different factions feel about it? Uh, Some of the Liverpool Manchester board members resigned over it. Wow. Said you shouldn't run railway trains on Sundays. A chap called Daniel Hodgson, who was an evangelical in the Church of England, and he was replaced by a chap called Charles Taylor, who would later go on to found the Vulcan Foundry. He was a Unitarian, and he had no problem with it. They were a lot more laid back about it, I guess. Far more laid back. Um, the whole debate came up with the Manchester and Leeds Railway in the 18, later 1830s, where they wanted to ban Sunday travelling completely. Wow. But Joseph Fielden, uh, a... Uh, major mill owner in Todmorden, which sort of straddles the Lancashire-Yorkshire border. He's somebody tall up in Parliament saying that this Sabbatarianism was a stalking horse for all the forms of transport because no one had a problem with running canal boats on Sundays. No one had a problem with stagecoaches running on Sundays. But suddenly the railway was thought to be more sinful somehow. Is that a noise issue or a, a disruption issue as well that they could... Push that forward too. One of the arguments they put forward was that the railway was unnatural. Horses are natural, waterways are natural. It was done by man's hand alone and therefore somehow inherently sinful. Mm. And there's some absolutely crazy sermons written at this time where you get some preachers saying that the railway train is predicted in the Bible. And this is it's crackers that the pillar of smoke and fire the Israelites followed in the wilderness was a railway train. So is the wilderness Chat Moss in that analogy? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty much 
aliens built the pyramids type stuff. So saying that the, the railway locomotive is predicted in the Bible. Whereas others were saying it's 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 wicked, it's sinful, it's demonic. Uh, I'm pointing out to the accident to William Huskisson as God's condemnation for the railway. So depending on what church you attended, then yeah. your your viewpoint on the railway could be completely different, even if you went to the same overall umbrella church. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting that the very first public passenger train of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, uh, 16th of September 1830, was a trainload of Quakers. It was the first passenger train in Liverpool and Manchester, first public train. It was actually the first train to be hired by anybody to go on a charter. 150 Quakers from Liverpool chartered the train to take them to Manchester and back to attend a Quaker meeting in Manchester. The Quakers had absolutely no problem with the railways. The Unitarians had no problem with them. Well, I guess they, they must have seen it as almost their technology. They what? Yeah. They, their gift to the world, almost. Mm-hmm. Like, they, they were not the patent holders, but it was something that had evolved within their society. But yes, definitely. Indeed, the Reverend William Gaskell, the husband of the famous novelist Elizabeth Gaskell, who was the minister at Cross Street Unitarian Chapel in the middle of Manchester, and that's where I'm the organist, by the way. He thought it was actually sinful and immoral to not run trains on Sundays and not to allow the urban poor to travel out of the city, to travel to the countryside to get some fresh air and to refresh their bodies and their souls on a Sunday. So he took the fully the opposite view. Fully opposite view, yeah. That it was beneficial to travel on a Sunday to travel into the countryside to get a train to, say, Hebden Bridge or Alderley Edge, places like that, on a Sunday, get out of the city, get into some healthy, clean air, and just to refresh yourself and have some fun. So the Liverpool Manchester ends up in a strange compromise where it's severely limited by what trains it can run on Sundays. It was, yes. Is it? Does that last all the way up to the days when it goes into the North Western? It does, yeah, all the way to 1845 when the bylaws are redrawn. <laughs> That's, that is... That's a long time to not be able to run trains on one day a week when everybody else is doing it. They, they were running them. They were running four trains on Sundays. Still not a lot. But the, the, but the, but they were just outside the hours of public worship. Still not when you when you read in um, a Liverpool Manchester book about the levels of traffic that they were dealing with, not just from the LNM but also from other railways joining it, and trying to juggle all that within these limited operating scopes on on the day of the Sabbath. Yeah, and and also then as now fitting all the engineering work. <laughs> um, what other evidence do we have of rivalry between the various factions? Was there a split between departments? The locomotive engineers were Quakers. The uh, chief engineers, af- after George Stevenson left in 1833, his successor John Dixon was a Quaker. Dixon had been apprenticed to George Stevenson, and all of Stevenson's apprentices were non-Anglicans. Is that the hand of Booth that we see there? Is he in charge of hiring? I think it's the hand of Stevenson. Mm. Dixon was succeeded by Edward Woods, who was another Quaker. And he was only 21 when he was appointed as chief engineer. That I found amazing. A chief engineer at 21. Yeah, of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. Uh, And he remained chief engineer of the Liverpool and Manchester section right until it was taken over by the London and North Western Railway into the 1850s. It's amazing. It's fantastic. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's another amazing thing is the age at which these people were accomplishing these things is startling to me because, well, going back a little bit, you say that, um, you know, it was it wasn't George Stevenson's company. It was Robert's. So, so Robert can't have been that old when the company was started because he was working on railways and railway engineering for decades. Robert was born in 1803, so he'd be, what, 21? What? That's amazing. And he had his own engineering company at 21. And and, which... At 21. He built Rocket and won at Renhill before he was 30. <laughs> wow. I mean, I mean, the equivalent is someone like Mozart. You mentioned Joseph Locke was another outsider, a uh, Roman Catholic. Were there any other religions within the overall umbrella of nonconformist that we could mention? And, and were there any representatives in engineering? I think famously there was Timothy Hackworth, who was a Wesleyan Methodist. Um, and that was at a time when Methodists were really considered to be absolutely beyond the pale. They were described as as being ranters. Hackworth lost his job at Wylam Colliery because of his Methodism for his preaching and giving it out tracts and Bibles and refusing to work on Sundays. And his wife, when she married Timothy and converted to Methodism, she was kicked out of the family home. 
Oh, wow. So there's quite a lot of antipathy towards um, the other, towards outsiders. But the Quakers who owned and operated the Stockton and Darlington didn't have such bigotry or biases, and they were perfectly happy to offer Timothy a job, just as they had been to offer George Stevenson a job. Mm. Were there any people from a Jewish background represented in engineering? Or do we see any of that in 19th century railways? Because, I, as I understand it, the was it the Clarendon Code didn't apply to them in the same way? The Clarendon Code applied to Protestant dissenters. Okay, so Jewish people were seen as outside of this code anyway. Yeah, Jews were allowed to marry under their own religion, uh, as were eventually Quakers. Where we do see Jewish involvement is largely later in the century, when, again, thanks to people like Benjamin Disraeli, being Jewish has become acceptable and respectable. Where we have the famous Rothschild family funding railways both in Britain uh, and in Europe, particularly in France. Bring it back to some of the personalities that are involved. On your Facebook page for On Historical Lines, you have written a few mini biographies and the most obvious one that was drawn to was George Stevenson yeah as you say was a Unitarian mostly self-taught but also took on ideas from lots of other people so he was learning from people but no official education yeah there's an interesting story about when he's trying to I guess pitch the Liverpool Manchester to the establishment in London and they can't understand him so he's very much an outsider to them he's a thick Geordie accent was he laughed out of uh, Parliament for that? pretty much that was during the first reading of the Liverpool and Manchester bill In 1825, the survey had gone spectacularly wrong. He'd relied on assistance to take all the levels for it, so that it was found out that a bridge at Eccles would have been underwater. Inconvenient. Just a bit, to fit your horses with armbands. And he was completely unprepared. He was torn to shreds by a a qualified London establishment civil engineer called Francis Giles. He ripped into the survey saying, look, it's full of errors, this man doesn't know what he's talking about. They thought he was either a foreigner because of his accent or that he was insane. Right. But he'd come up with this attitude earlier from the London establishment, capital E establishment, in 1816 when he came up with his minor safety lamp. Right, okay, so he has been through this mill before. He's been through it before. He designed a minor safety lamp on his own and it worked. But at the same time, Sir Humphrey Davy in London, fellow of the Royal Society and all that, had come up with his own safety lamp, which also worked. Humphrey Dave in the Royal Society said that Stevenson couldn't possibly have invented this safety lamp. He nicked the design. So then what you had were Stevenson saying, by heck no, lad, that is my design. And you had this group of very wealthy northeast merchants, businessmen, colliery owners standing up to Sir Humphrey Dave saying, hang on a minute now, our northern lad did it off his own recognisance. He, he didn't steal anything. And if anything, he did it before you. Mm. And I think that really set the mould for George Stevenson's response to London, if that makes sense. Are we seeing like a chink in the armour here and they're desperate to stick the knife in? That's really interesting. So can we see this colouring his future decisions? Or did it just knock knock some sense into him? I don't know, because if you say he'd relied on all faulty data and stuff, did it make him reevaluate what he was doing? I think it played into his existing distrust of London, London experts, and the establishment, if that makes sense. Mm. He was a self-taught man. He'd got where he was by his own efforts. Yes, there was the whole PR guru in the shape of Pease and Nicholas Woods. But you have to admit, he did use his own sweat, blood and tears to get where he was. And to be told by some London expert, oh no, you didn't do this. This isn't your work. You couldn't possibly do this. You're uneducated. I think it gave him... There's always a typical Northern chip on your shoulder about the South and that there, London. And this really played into it. We don't need London. We don't need the London experts. And there's also the religious side of it as well. Because London, the establishment and the church establishment, not to be trusted, we don't we don't deal with that. They're constantly knocking us down. But actually, we're good enough, if that makes sense. On a more general note, in your opinion, was George Stevenson a true visionary? Did he really envisage the impact the railways would have Or was it a case of firing an arrow and painting a bullseye around it afterwards? I think he was a visionary. How do we know this? He wasn't alone in building early locomotives about 1812 to 1815. He'd built locomotives at Killingworth. There were locomotives down the road at Wylam. There was 
the famous steam elephant that work at John Buddle's colliery. The Middleton engines were working in Leeds. But after about 1815, with the end of the Napoleonic Wars, when the prices of horses drops and they become cheap and affordable again, the only person to continue with building locomotives was George Stevenson. So for a lot of people, it was a stopgap. It was a stopgap. The locomotive came along because of the Napoleonic Wars, because horses became uneconomical. The cost of fodder rose two or three times. The cost of horses went up at least five times. The cost of labour was going up. So suddenly you needed something that was far cheaper to run than a horse. A locomotive could be built in a colliery workshop. Water was free. It would burn the coal from the colliery. You could reduce your manpower cost. You didn't need stable hands. You didn't need farriers to look after the horses. You didn't need all the horses. You could reduce your operating costs by something like 80% by having a locomotive but as soon as horses become affordable again and as these early locomotives are starting to clank and clunk and falling to bits it's no longer economical to keep them going so you go back to a horse and the horse has an advantage if it doesn't explode but george perseveres george persevered everybody else had fallen by the wayside and george persevered he stuck with it moving on to 1830 when we see the emergence of liverpool and manchester how much of that is George's vision and how much of it is, say, Booth's. Because George, doesn't he famously say, or it's rumoured to have said, um, that we should build them all to the same gauge because one day they're all going to be connected. Yeah, he said that in association with the Canterbury and Whitstable. Yes, okay. All the way down in Kent, opened before Liverpool and Manchester in May 1830, he was asked, why is it the same gauge as your colliery cart gauge in the northeast? Why is it the same as Liverpool and Manchester? Because he said, May 1830, because one day they'll all be joined together. So that really kind of does give us an insight into what he was thinking. Yeah. I mean, hugely, because it's not after railways had already been proven to be a successful technology. You have a handful of lines and a handful of public railways. Well, not even that. Yeah. I mean, it's before the Liverpool and Manchester opens. But, 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 you, but what you also had were visionaries who were considered to be insane in their own day. Uh, a chap called Gray, who in the 1820s proposed a national network of railways running on the blanking stop system, the rack and pinion. Wow, a, a network of rack and pinion railways across the UK. A national network of rack and pinion railways across the UK in the early 1820s before the Stockton and Darlington Ooh. came along. William James was also promoting a railway network, which he called the Grand Junction Railway between London uh, and Birmingham. So not to be confused with the other Grand Junction Railway, which does... Not, not to be confused with the other one. And he was promoting his railway idea, but at the same time promoting it a locomotive worked railway, not just horses, and had an agreement with, with George Stevenson to promote his patent locomotives. So the idea of a national network wasn't new, but it was a theoretical one at best. I mean, these people have been considered to be insane, or like William James had gone bust because they put all their capital in it. It hadn't come to fruition because they couldn't find financiers for it and backers. So George saying, yes, the one day will be all connected. On the one hand, he's looking back to James and to Gray, but he's also really looking forward. And he's proven right, handily. Yeah. But the fate was on his side. How was Robert's education and upbringing different to George's? It was a world away. George, by the time Robert was being educated, was a very comfortably well-off man. He was earning over £100 a year, which then was an awful lot of money. And he used that. He George was the classic pushy parent. And to a certain extent, he lived through Robert. He used his money to give Robert the best start in life, the best education. And that meant sending to a school in Newcastle. And that was the Dissenters Academy, a Unitarian private school on Percy Street, attached to the Unitarian Church at Hanover Square. And it was run by the Reverend John Bruce, a Unitarian minister. And it was at Percy Street where Robert would have had a very broad classical education focusing on not just learning the classics but mathematics, trigonometry and this uniquely Unitarian subject, natural philosophy, which you might today now think of as a mix between hard science and, again, philosophy, thinking about the world, how the world is made up, being encouraged to think outside the box And he came to the attention of uh, the Reverend William Turner, the minister at Hanover Square Chapel. And Hanover Square Unitarian Chapel was the place to be seen in Georgian Newcastle. It's where the great 
and the good went to worship. So a bit of networking might be going on there. A lot of networking was going on between other Unitarians, and it was also a place to go to be seen and to join in this networking. And it was thanks to William Turner. William Turner gave Robert Stevenson's education a polish, and he said in later life he was eternally grateful for that from the Reverend Turner. And it's a Reverend Turner who got Robert into places his father could never have been, such as membership of the Literary and Philosophical Society, because he was a, a bright young thing. He was a learned man, and he lacked the thick Geordie accent of his father, which in such a class-conscious society would have held George back. He would have been best common and popular. He's someone who works with hands. We don't want you in here. You know, you're not our type of person. Whereas Robert was brought up to be a young gentleman, was well-educated, was learned, spoke and dressed like a gentleman. Because remember, the Peters had told George how to speak, how to dress, always to wear a clean shirt every day. He was a far more refined individual, and these doors were open to him, which meant that he could get on in society. How much was Robert his own man, and how much was he George Mark II? I find it very hard to find Robert Stevenson's personality. I think he was eternally in the shadow of his father. Even towards the end of his life, when you read letters written by Robert talking about Rocket at Rain Hill, he's always deferential to his father and he defers to his father saying, it's not really my idea. We know historically it was his idea, but he says, no, it's my dad's. George used his son to get places he could never have got. In many ways, he used Robert as his thinking brain. George was an intuitive mechanic who was good with his hands. So was Robert, but he had the theoretical underpinnings behind it. So, in effect, George wore his technical brain in another head, if that makes sense. George lived through Robert. Robert got into places George could never have been, but as a result, George was able to go through on his coattails. Do we see a bit of um, George, is, is saying it in a cruel way, using other people then? Because you've mentioned this about George would pick up ideas from other people and then sort of stop seeing those people after he'd got the idea. He did, yeah. He he surrounded himself with like-mannered people. He he liked being surrounded by bright young things. Even towards the end of his life, he says he liked it. It was challenging and invigorating to him, but he was also very apt at using other people's ideas without crediting them and using other people. He took out his second patent in 1816 with William Loss of Newcastle for a locomotive, iron rails and iron wheels for cast iron fish bellied rails were the best you could possibly do and George Stevenson and Losh both went to the Unitarian Chapel in Newcastle at Hanover Square they would spend pleasant Sunday afternoons together at the Losh's house and the Losh family were a really big deal uh, especially James Losh who was the recorder of Newcastle basically the top man in the city but then Birkinshaw comes along with wrought iron rail which is far superior to cast rail and suddenly whoosh Stevenson drops Losh, adopts the new wrought iron rail, breaks every single tie with Losh, and it's like that friendship never happened. And suddenly, Birkinshaw rail made at the Bedlington foundry is the best thing since sliced bread. Yes, you want to have a Losh felt about it. Yes, well, I think we can definitely see some of that um, constant churn of friends, depending on who was most useful at the time. Yeah. If we think more about Booth, then... You say that Booth is the mastermind, really, behind Liverpool and Manchester. How much of his background as a Unitarian is reflected in the way the company is set up? Or the way that he moulds the company, shall we say? Unitarians are both democratic and meritocratic. So they believe in the right man for the right job, and that everybody could have a say. And that makes a Unitarian business a little bit different to, say, a Quaker business. Where a Quaker business, you'd have a committee to manage it, but you wouldn't have a particular individual as the managing director, if that makes sense. You'd have a very egalitarian structure where everyone's pretty much on the same level, working in a committee. There's no paid management staff. Does that make decision-making difficult? It does. It makes it democratic, but it makes decision-making slow. And it means, on the other hand, you have direct supervision. There's no massive gulf between capital and labour. There's no between the bosses and the workers, if that makes sense. Whereas the Unitarian model is different because they're used to having people in charge, uh, the best people for the job. And uh, not only that, but they're used to having educated people in charge because Quakers don't have ministers, mm. whereas Unitarians do. And a Unitarian minister is, is, is essentially a theologian in residence, if that makes sense. Very learned, very scholarly. 
someone who values learning uh, and bringing up others to that level. Unitarians really valuing education for men and women and, and everybody. So what you see with Booth is you have this skills learned individual at the top of the tree, and that's him. And then beneath him, you have his subordinates who he's encouraging to come along and building them up, training them up. Uh, heading the various operating departments. So it's far more hierarchical than a Quaker business. Mm -hmm. So you think about a Quaker business, it's pretty much horizontal. A Unitarian business is like a family tree. It all goes up to a point with operating departments, subdivisions, etc. It's a much more modern capitalist model, and it's the model that would be copied by every railway since. Well, every railway since done so many businesses as well. Yeah. have mirrored that setup. That's really interesting. If we flip things around, because we've spoken quite a lot about the nonconformist factions, what else can you tell me about Booth? Booth was an inventor in his own right. He'd designed a steamboat in 1819, which was to run from Liverpool to North Wales. He designed the boiler for the Lancashire Witch, which was built by Robert Stevenson. He designed another boiler for the twin sisters, and that was a peculiar looking thing, uh, which is two vertical boilers with two chimneys, hence the name Twin Sisters. He designed the central heating system, of all things, again, it's hot water technology, for the uh, Renshaw Street Unitarian Chapel in Liverpool, where he was a member. Oh, wow. So if you've got hot water central heating, you've got Booth to thank for it. Yeah, pretty much. Wow. He also designed a coal-burning boiler, which wouldn't make smoke. Oh, yes, because crucially, the Liverpool managed to run on coke. Yes. For that reason, that coal made too much smoke. Yes. Uh, and he's also the man to thank for the three-link screw coupling. All oh, right. Yeah, a huge amount of input then. Absolutely. He designed the three-link screw coupling in about 1833 uh, and took out a patent for it in 1836, along with sprung buffers uh, and a form of carriage axle grease that was still in use in the 1950s. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, and screw coupling's still in use today. Yeah, so the screw coupling is coming up to 200 years old and invented by Henry Booth for the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. I mean, it's incredible. You wonder, did the man have any spare time or was, uh, you know, leisure not an option in those days? Because <sighs> I think that about the Stevensons and other people like that too. I don't think it was an option. There's this... For good or bad, this that the Protestant work ethic, which says that everything you do must be of worth and is for God. So every act you do is is holy. So you do it to the absolute best of your ability, which means you can become a workaholic. Mm. You become a perfectionist workaholic. It's, on the one hand, it's terribly unhealthy, but in an emerging technology like the railways... It means for people like Henry Booth and Robert Stevenson, whose minds are just throwing off ideas like sparks from a Catherine wheel. It's absolutely a brilliant work ethic for them. And did it attract people who were workaholics then, these emerging technologies? Yes. The, 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 the great Victorian triumvirate of engineers, Robert Stevenson, Isambard Brunel and Joseph Locke were workaholics. Mm. They didn't know how to stop. They didn't know how to relax. And they killed themselves through work. Mm. It makes you wonder, really, well, it makes me wonder how many people didn't get to sort of show what they could do because they didn't live in the right time. Say, say if you'd been born 50 years earlier, there's no emerging steam technology at the time to be involved with. We see this explosion in people with a huge amount of talent and, and how as unfortunate it would have been to be ahead of your time. And I guess we do see some of that with these sparks of early locomotive development, but where, say, for example, the the metal technology isn't there yet, so you're not able to make rails properly. Yeah, they were ahead of the time. But again, for the Unitarians, there's a deep belief in progress, of making everything better for as many people as possible. This emerging technology wasn't just doing it for technology's sake. It was for the betterment of humanity if that makes sense Mm. and for the unitarians there wasn't this clash between science and religion unitarians would respect the bible and do respect the bible but they don't see it as being literally factually true so they didn't believe that the world was literally created in six days and you have early geologists like hutton and lyle who basically invent geology about 1833, who'd find out the world is billions of years old. They were Unitarians. You also get at this time people like Mary Anning finding the first dinosaur fossils. 
So suddenly these old certainties that the world is only 6,000 years old, it was made in six days, there was a great flood, are being thrown out of the window. People of faith like the Unitarians are saying, this is brilliant. Science is brilliant. Mm. Science is another tool to find out about this mystery called God. And I guess that ethos of um, things being for the betterment of everybody certainly encourages experimentation and critical thinking with regards to science and technology. You know, some of these avenues might be dead ends, but at least you learn something from it. Absolutely. Unitarians, above all, were taught to think and taught to ask questions. If we flip things around then, do we ever in this period see an emergence of Anglicans onto the railways and locomotives? We do in London. What kind of roles do they fill? Usually civil engineers, people like Charles Vignol, Stevenson's big rival, or people like John Braithwaite, who was a partner with Ericsson in the novelty at Rain Hill. They become civil engineers. They become quite respected and respectable. I mean, they already are respectable. They're part of that establishment. But they never quite rival the Stevensons. I mean, Braithwaite, Milner and Company in London, they only built a handful of locomotives. Most of them went to export in America. The the big rival to Stevenson, Edward Berry, uh, in Liverpool, he was a solid Anglican. But there's not much really known about him as a as an individual, if that makes sense. Is that because he didn't have this huge sort of PR machine? Yeah, he didn't. Um, he had his wife, uh, posthumously. But there wasn't, as an individual, there's very little actually known about him. Mm. So difficult to tell. Yeah. And then you say in civil engineering. So at what point do we see this coming out? Is this during the early stages or do they sort of come into the, the sphere of railway operations later? Very much in the 1830s. And when you start getting the really big locomotive building firms, I think about, again, in the 1850s, think about Kitson and Leeds or Bayer Peacock. They are uh, effectively unitarian firms backed by uh, Keith and Kin. It's railway engineering was a, it was new, it was emerging, and it hadn't been professionalised, if that makes sense. There was no Royal Institution in London. There was no Institute of Civil Engineers in London. There was no links to church and state for railway engineering, which meant it was pretty much new territory, is open to anybody really. There wasn't even the ancient guild structure which had controlled many crafts, which again, they were establishment Anglicans only. So suddenly with heavy engineering and railway engineering, you have this new emergent field, this new technology, where suddenly it didn't matter if you weren't an Anglican. And in fact, non-conformists were drawn to it because there were none of these links to the establishment and they could very quickly forge it as their own. Do you think that the convergence of the relaxing of laws about non-conformist religion in Britain and the emerging technologies of coal and the better iron working stuff, do you think that they couldn't have existed without each other? Do you think one had to happen so the other one could? Yes, the non-conformists had to become respectable. Otherwise it would have been, you would never be reading about yeah. it. They had to show to the establishment that we're respectable, we're loyal, because during the Napoleon it was, non-conformists were thought to be disloyal, because supporting ideas of liberty, equality, fraternity, that's a bit like supporting the French, isn't it? So they were thought to be disloyal. They had to prove you were respectable, you were loyal, you were men of business, you were copper-bottomed, if that makes sense. And as you come on in society, become more respectable, that starts knocking down barriers and opening more doors. So it's thanks to these largely self-made non-conformist men of business who call a spade a spade and took the thumbs in the waistcoats. They become wealthy. Wealth in itself brings a certain amount of power and influence. It means after 1832 they can sit in Parliament. So again, there's more social caste, there's more respect. So not only can they make changed laws respecting themselves but they've sort of made it they've reached the high point you could aim for in in english society is becoming a member of parliament and in that way joseph pease becomes you know a, a huge milestone yeah. then. and it's been said of him that the most important thing he did was take up his seat in parliament in 1832 because with his seat he could unlock parliament for nonconformists and particularly for railways he could use his influence as a railway owner in Parliament. He didn't. They no longer had to rely on allies in Parliament or in the House of Lords like Lord Warncliffe. The railway owners and railway engineers were in Parliament itself. And that's a crucial stage for the development of the railways and development of what would become a national network. It's a bit of fun to pontificate on what could have been 
was the railway as we know it an inevitability or was there a point or a number of points in its early days where you think it could have been sunk completely for example what if Trevithick had decided not to do a locomotive and had just stuck with the steam carriage in terms of the locomotive there was an inevitability because of the economic situation between about 1812, 1860, because of the Napoleonic Wars, because of the cost of horses and fodder and men's wages, there would have to have been some other means of traction to get coal, which was then an emerging industry, from the pits in the north to basically London, which is where the demand was for this new fuel. The growth of the metropolis in London needed coal. That coal came from Yorkshire in the northeast. In order to exploit it, they had to find a cheaper way of doing it than horses. The locomotive was inevitable, but it, and this is old-fashioned history, it did need a big man of history like George Stevenson to pursue with it. So this is the great man theory of history rather than the trends and forces one? The great man theory, yeah. It, it doesn't look likely that anyone else would have persevered with it other than George. But in terms of the railway, if the Stockton and Darlington hadn't been a success, the growth of public railways would have been curtailed, perhaps for a few years, but it was effectively an overnight success. Mm. It was a large-scale experiment because early railways had been private, they'd been relatively short, they hadn't been open to as much public scrutiny. So if the Stockton and Darlington had gone wrong, that could have been a major hiccup. As it was, it was another five years till the Liverpool and Manchester came along. But there's a comment from Timothy Hackworth to Robert Stevenson just before Rain Hill, and I think it's very pertinent. Because it's all about the battle of the locomotive. So Hackworth enters Saint-Pré versus the rocket. Yes. Was he the next best thing, do you think? Yes, but Robert Stevenson goes to Hackworth for advice. Oh. Not only does he write to Hackworth to repudiate the claims that locomotives are dangerous and won't never do the work of a stationary engine, which is what the official report by Rastrick and Walkhead said, you don't want locomotives... You want stationary engines. They're cheaper, they're more economical, they can do more work. So he writes to Hackworth saying, look, give me statistics on your locomotives. You've been doing this longer than anybody else. How effective are your locomotives? He writes back with all these stats, and he can basically demolish the report of Walker and Rastrick. But he also writes to him, is this going to work? Are we going to be a success? And Timothy writes back to him saying, don't be disheartened. It's not your fault if someday in history it is said the Liverpool and Manchester Railway were strangled by ropes. So poetic. It's beautifully poetic. And it's Hackworth saying, stick to your guns, lad. (laughs) Locomotives are the way to go. If the Liverpool and Manchester has stationary engines, and they're not going to work on this, they won't work for a public railway, and if it collapses, it's not your fault. So you could say the future of the railway did hang in the balance for those few months leading up to Rainhill, where Walker and Rastrick had said, locomotives aren't going to work, go for stationary engines, but the board of directors, Liverpool and Manchester, led by Henry Booth, said, hang on a minute, let's test this empirically, let's see if a locomotive is as good. Can a locomotive climb hills? Walker and Rastrick said, it can't climb hills, it's no good at going up hills, let's test it. So up until that point, and it was proved before Rainhill, by Rocket, the day before Rainhill, the board of directors Liverpool and Manchester, with Henry Booth obviously, and George Stevenson driving Rocket, did something which completely annulled the Rainhill trials and completely blew Rastrick and Walker's report out of the water. It ran from Liverpool to Rainhill, and it went up the incline plane at Rainhill, one in 95, with a load of passenger train behind it, which Walker and Rastrick said he could never do. Well, it's amazing really as well, because if you were going to design a locomotive for going up hills, I wouldn't draw a rocket. <laughs> no, she was designed for speed. And uh, Yeah, exactly. And and, and the fact that it did, um, it just proves what a sound design it was, I guess. Yeah, and it completely negates the whole argument that the Rainhill tries that locomotives can't climb hills. <laughs> Fantastic. So you think that that was the crucial flashpoint? It was Rainhill. On that note, if you could have the time machine... And you could go back to a specific event in railway history, either to witness or to warn somebody off something. What would it be and why? I would have wanted to see, in June 1812, the Middleton Railway. That first ever commercial use of a railway steam locomotive. And something which did its job for how many years? 25, 30 years? And they stuck with the same system, like, it works, it's fine, no need to improve. It worked, it's fine, mm. yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good. That's a good choice. Not the not the obvious one. I would have gone for. And I'd love to see Ren Hill. Then. Yeah, well, I'll let you have the second date. Yeah, Hill, then. yeah. But uh, but as a Yorkshireman, <laughs> we did it first in Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. You've got a new book out. I do. Yeah. What's it about? It's about uh, the locomotives of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. It's the first time that anybody's actually sat down and written a book about the locomotives of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. There's been chapters in earlier books, but no actual complete study on them. I was going to say, and in your work as well, because the book that's preceded this is The Operating History. Yeah, that's correct. Which does have a few bits about locomotives, because obviously they play such a huge part in it. Yeah. But this is solely concentrating on motive power. Solely on motive power and, uh, in part five, the rolling stock. So it's divided into five parts. The first part looks at the mainstream locomotive, the Stevenson locomotive, so Rocket, Planet, Lion, all the way up to 1845. And a lot of people just think... Liverpool and Manchester locomotives, it starts and ends with Rocket, and there's another 15 years of history. Part two looks at all the weird and wonderful experiments and they also ran. So things like Timothy Hackworth's Saint Paray, uh, John Erickson and Braithwaite's novelty and what happened next. Some equally bizarre machines built in Manchester with vertical cylinders and bell cranks and all sorts of peculiarities. Uh, there's a chapter on the engine man and the firemen and what it was like to work on the railway and the Liverpool and Manchester of course was the first because it was the first had ever the first ever railway strike actually in 1836 over pay and conditions oh right so they lasted six years before they had a strike <laughs> and then what about the rolling stock what can you tease us about that initially it was very weird and wonderful we have this image of in our head of rocket pulling bright yellow and bright blue carriages but the earliest rolling stock, we don't really know what it looked like. The descriptions we have, they're a bit odd, they're a bit unusual. And they're still even having passengers travelling on the roofs, despite having lots of bridges over the line. So they must obviously have ducked, a bit like in the Buster Keaton film. <laughs> but I guess a lot of our um, view of the trains of the Liverpool Manchester is directly from the LMS reconstructions that were done. Yes. For the centenary. Yeah. So the image of Rainhill Condition Rocket pulling yellow coaches and these blue opens, I would say is is almost a 20th century image. It is, and it's a fiction, as Rocket in Rainhill Condition never pulled passenger trains. Rocket was obsolete by 1830, and it probably was never in front of <laughs> It lasted a year. a year. It lasted less than a year. Six months. Wow. October to January. And the replica coaches built in 1930 at Derby were built on the cheap, with second-hand materials, and they were scaled to look right behind Lion. Well, Lion itself, we found out now, is a pastiche. It's a pastiche, yeah. It's a figment of what the LMS thought it should look like. Yes. Uh, and my bugbear is the blue coaches, and I, if I could go back in a time machine and say, don't build them, don't build them... <laughs> because they're standing room only, they have no roofs, and we know that Liverpool and Manchester never had standing only carriages. It never had, th until the last six months of its history, never had third class, and those carriages are described as being third class. But is that I mean, a modern the, interpretation of third class? It's, it's, a, it's class. a modern interpretation, yeah. So, because so I remember in your book you say that first class means express, yeah, and second class is stopping. Yeah. Those terms get changed later on. First class was stop. It stopped only once at Newton. Second class was stopping by request only. So it didn't stop at all the stations. Mm. But when third class came along under the Gladstone Act in 1844, that said the third class train had to stop at every station by law. So the LMS one is just a complete fantasy. I think that's uh, a gross misuse of the time machine, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a very it's a very personal bug, Mary, man. It really annoys me, especially since Hornby made the models. Well, yeah, Hornby's models are completely accurate. If you are modelling the 1930s centenary, though, yeah. Who would you say this book's aimed at? The average enthusiast, I think. There's some technical material in there, but I hope to have written it in such a way to make the early railways understandable, to bring them alive to make it relatable so someone can read it and come away with a solid knowledge of, say, Planet and what it's like to drive and fire it, just as much as you'd get from reading a book about an 8F. I'm halfway through it at the moment, and what I found 
incredible is it, the way it was able to make me understand the pace of change in those early years. Like you say, Rocket lasted six months. In my head, Rocket and her sisters, sisters in inverted commas, were a class of engines. I now know that none of them were the same and each one was a gradual incremental uh, improvement on the last or an experimentation with a different method for doing something. So none of them were the same. Yeah. So you've got start with Rocket in October 1829. And in September 1830, 11 months later, you've got Planet. And Planet is a progenitor right up to Evening Star. Mm. It's, it's the first truly modern locomotive. They get it right with Planet. And it's incredible. It's an incredible short space of time. You go from rocket to planet. And then that sets the mould for the, the locomotive development. Yeah. But even after that, they were still experimenting. The idea, a, the weight of a piston in a horizontal cylinder would rapidly wear it oval, died hard. So you see, still see vertical cylinder locomotives being built in the middle of the 1830s, despite planet showing, no, this, this isn't going to be a problem. See people experimenting with different fuels because coke, which is a smokeless fuel, was also incredibly expensive. So they're trying to burn coal, they're trying to burn anthracite, all with different degrees of success to try and improve the efficiency of the locomotive. And you all sort of get some, some very Heath Robinson affairs in the Liverpool and Manchester, like John Melling's coupling wheel, where instead of using coupling rods, he uses a counter-rotating wheel to couple the driving wheels together. Clever idea, but it's just a, it's just a bit out there. It never caught on. But I say that, but Francis Webb on the LNWR in the 1880s came back with the idea for the same reasons that John Melling had come up with it in the 1830s. Where can we find your book? You can find it in all good bookshops. Buy it directly from the publishers, Pen and Sword, and from other good online retailers. And where can we find you online if we want to find out more about early railways? You can find me on Twitter, at Railstory. You can find me on Facebook, on Historical Lines. And you can also find me on YouTube. Just search for Rail Story. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, it's to, again, it's to get the good news of early railways out there to everybody. Um, not just through books and talking to people, but yeah, let, let's use everything as as many means as possible. And I am absolutely amazed how successful it is. It began as something to keep me occupied during lockdown. The channel's just over a year old, coming up to 3,000 subscribers. And there's this really wonderful community that's built up of other early railway fans and nerds with really thoughtful, informed comments and discussions taking place. It's absolutely fantastic of bringing together, and I hadn't planned this, of early railway enthusiasts across the world. And I've made friends through it, and I've got offers to uh, go to Norway to have a drive on a Stevenson locomotive in Norway built in 1861, or go to America, uh, which is brilliant. So it's saying that early railways are interesting, and particularly showing footage of, say, Planet. It's like, well, yeah. I, th- I feel like there was a void almost in this area of interest because the late days of steam and the emergence of diesels was covered, wartime railways are covered and everything else. But I don't think there's been much of a, a solid resource on early 19th century railways like there has been with your YouTube channel and your Facebook page on historical lines. Thank you. I, I think it's fascinating and, and I've learned so much and the regularity of your output and the quality of it, I think is brilliant. Thank you. It was definitely worth a look. Have we got anything else coming up? In terms of books, I've got a book on the uh, Grand Crimean Railway coming out next year, which is the first mm. railway built in a war zone, which is a bit different. And I'm also doing a book on Planet. Specifically on Planet, on your baby? Specifically on my baby, yeah. It's like, oh, everything <laughs> I could have wanted. Uh, so looking at Planet, looking at her sister, the Samson class, the O4O version. Not just looking at planets specifically, but where the design came from, how the design evolved, how the design influenced locomotive building globally, but also trying to track down each and every one of the little things. Because they were built right around the world, they were built in America, France. Was it the first internationally exported class? It was, yes. Yeah, rather than a one-off prototype or... Yeah. Well, I think that's a really good place to stop. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Anthony. It's been a real pleasure. My pleasure, and thank you for asking me. And thank you for really indulging me on this subject, because I've wanted to do this ever since episode one, and I could not find the right voice in myself to do it, so I'm really glad that you came on with your expertise and knowledge of this area to tell us about it. Thank you, it's my pleasure. It's one of my 
um, mastermind questions, historical Unitarians and Quakers in the 19th century. Go. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you. And I hope you can come on again for another podcast. I would love to. Excellent. Thank you for listening to another episode of Railway Mania. As always, there are more episodes in the works. So if you haven't already, please do subscribe. If you want to flick through the back catalogue, then please do check out the website at railwaymania.net. <laughs>